But I want to double click on something. So I read your book, 100 Million Offers, incredible book. Basically, it's a book on how to create value. You talk about how you would go to a company and they would give you 30% of the company with almost no investment. And you've done this over and over yeah. dozens of times or so. You've never really explicitly talked about how you construct that value proposition for the business owner. So tell me how you get somebody to give you 30% of your business with no money down. We do a combination. To be fair, the deal has evolved over time. And uh, I wrote the book, I want to say three or four years ago, between 20 and 24 deals in similar-ish structures. So we had um, an element of cash flow, which was either a profit share or a revenue share, depending on how volatile the business was. Um, and then we had uh, a profits interest um, based on some agreed upon basis that we had or above a basis that we you know mutually agreed on. And usually that that number was very low because the companies didn't really have a ton of intrinsic value. And so that was more or less the combination of what it was. It's like, okay, your business is worth 2 million bucks. Uh, we get 30% of everything above that. And for the work that we do in the meantime, we need cash flow because we have a huge team helping you put all these things together. And so that's pretty much how the deals work. Over time, I started writing checks into companies because I noticed it changed the dynamic a little bit favorably for us. And it was less like we're consultants for hire. <laughs> now we only do cash in deals. That's probably more traditional. We look for a lot of majority covenants, even if we're not in a majority position, just because we want to have a good amount of operating control on the business. And honestly, in some ways, it's just you know keeping the emotionality of it from the founder from making like a really poor decision. Every one of the covenants that we're going to ask for are not Thing, like when we explain them, they're like, okay, I get that. The biggest companies we have are, you know, four, four plus years that we've had with us. And some of those we're looking for, you know, liquidity events right now. And I think we're kind of at a point of like, okay, where to from here? That's kind of, I would say the position that Layla and I are in right now with our holdings and kind of like, okay, what went well from this last round? What are we going to do differently next time? And I would say the big, the big one is that we're just going to buy fewer, bigger businesses at the onset, because we've learned that a lot of times the bigger the business, the more we can help. Because when it's a smaller business, it's like we have to build so much infrastructure. A lot of times there's, there's no CRM. So it's a, you know, it's all, it's all Google sheets and things like that. So we have to implement a full CRM so we can get data pushed to us. We even know what's going on in the business. Finances are typically a mess. It's just, you know, his mom's book, keeper that's been doing it, you know, across the kitchen table <laughs> that's been, that's been doing the finances. There's typically no leadership team in place. It's usually a founder and like maybe a first follower, somebody who's really loyal and kind of like an integrator for them, but oftentimes they don't even have that. And so when we've looked at the more and more mature businesses, it's like they have a lot of these pieces in place. And so then we can get straight to value creation. There's no leaking bucket. Yeah. Or less. Just to double click, you're really good at deconstructing processes. Yeah. So you go to a founder and you say, okay, your company's worth $5 million. I'm going to go and invest. And then I want 20% of the upside or 30% of the upside. How do you ensure to the founder that you're not just freeloading on the upside? And do you create milestones? Do you, What construct do you use to align yourself? Not milestones. It's been pretty much straight up. Um, we get 30% of the upside. Just trust. Yeah. And that's, I mean, and that's been the whole point of building the brand and building the, the presence that we have has been to have that trust. Um, and I would say that it's definitely lubricated the deal process overall. Um, we don't need to do nearly as much diligence, you know, as a, as a traditional PE. So we can, we can move a lot faster on deals and we've generated a lot of cash anyways in the meantime. So that now if we do want to write bigger checks, we can do that. I can't write the, the check sizes that I would like to write, but at this moment we can stroke a 10 or, or a 15 or $20 million check. If we really like something, I can't write multiple of those hundred million dollar checks for a company. When we got introduced a month ago, we <laughs> started talking about this crossroads that you're at. Yeah. You've engineered this model that works where you're owning large percentage of slightly smaller businesses. Yeah. And you're thinking, should we continue building this kind of Berkshire holding company or should we go the private equity route? What are the pros and cons in your opinion? If anyone who's listening is like, he doesn't sound decided, I'm aware. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, on one hand, we could raise, you know, outside funds. Transparently, I'm just so afraid of losing someone else's money. I've made mistakes in the past for me and it's like, okay, that's an Alex mistake. I'll own that. And it was all my money. Losing someone else's money, it makes me feel sick to think about because I just know how hard it is to make money and to just lose it for somebody else just like it kills me. It's definitely an irrational fear of mine, but that's road one. Road two is that we continue to still write our own checks and we still to go after bigger companies, but we just take smaller chunks. So we actually go back to the minority thing that we started with, but just with much bigger uh, companies. And I think we'd be able to get pretty good valuations on those companies if we're coming in as a minority position with value add. The third bucket is we just continue to do what we have been doing and just continue to level up slowly over time the size companies that we have with not necessarily the desire to sell them, but some of the companies are really, really cash flow positive and I don't need to sell them. Like some of the software ones, we're absolutely looking to have a liquidity event from an exit because we just plow all the money back into the business, which it should do. So those are kind of like the three doors that we have in front of us for like where to from here. I've been honestly split because I'm also continuing to run what we're currently doing. I would say that the likelihood that Layla and I raise a fund is high. 
I just don't have a timeline. You're rationally being very slow in your decision making because institutional capital and outside capital is in for penny, in for pound. You take that dollar, you're basically beholden to those LPs for a decade. What's coming through your pipeline? Are you getting billion dollar deals? Because I think that should really factor in. Our deal flow is absurd. How do you even process it? So we get about 3,000 companies a month, about 100 a day that come inbound that are trying, that specifically apply for like, we want to be a portfolio company. Um, We have many more than that, that just like want help and want information and things like that. But a hundred a day come in that fill out a full mini question application. And then those go to my deal team. So we have automated sifting that kind of just in the background based on the application questions that automatically, you know, remove 95%. We don't do any deals outside of the US. So that takes off half because 55% of my audience is international. So we have 45% left from there. It's like, we don't want other investors on the cap table. That takes another half out from there. We've got it just, we just kind of like whittle our way down to what are the kind of investable deals. We probably get two to three deals a day that are legitimate businesses that are of size, that are US based. They're all over the place because the content I have helps a lot of different businesses. So we'll get you know, uh, a florist with a commercial cleaning company with a, you know, SaaS company. And then tomorrow it'll be a logistics broker with like, it just, it's all over the place. What's the revenue split on that? So 50% are zero to a million, 25% are one to 5 million in top line. And then 25% are 5 million plus. And obviously there's, you know, a lot above 5 million plus in terms of, I mean, it's 25%, but I want to say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of like 5% of deals are doing over 20. So that's where that taking a hundred whittling down to like two-ish, two to three deals a day. Those ones are usually companies that are doing over 10 million and have all these other kind of things that are interesting about them. But sometimes we just hop on the phone with the founder and then we're like, this guy's crazy. A lot of times on the first call, we disqualify like 90% of companies because they're like, this is hairy or this feels weird or I don't really like the business or whatever else. A lot of times it's businesses that don't have any like compounding vehicle. And so that's what we look a lot for is I have this theory that a business can only compound if you have a product that people never stop buying or you have a network of people that never stop selling. And so it's like if you have a real estate brokerage, right? Uh, you have a network of people that never stop selling for you. You have some reoccurring that comes from, you know, somebody sells a house and four years later they come back to you. But for the most part, it's onesie twosies. On the customer side, you have a SaaS software that's super sticky. You, know, you sell IT services and people don't really churn out. Those are the types of services that we focus a lot more on now. Um, in our first round of companies, we basically had to take companies that were really profitable or had like, they had something that we really liked about them, but they, almost none of them had really good revenue retention. And so we spend a lot of time building that in so that we can get that compounding. But we just want to see that people keep buying and that there are good gross margins as they continue to buy. And so then those are the businesses that we can just knock out of the park because we know how to build acquisition out really well. We know how to build delivery out really well. The things that Layla and I are probably not the best at is like we're not the best at like super techie stuff. Like even though we have 40% of our portfolio is software based, we heavily rely on the recruiting side of who we bring in, who is good at that stuff Mm -hmm. so that we can then just do all the business fundamentals to that model. And you're a big believer in demand constrained businesses, not supply constrained businesses. If I want to put my brand behind something, I want something that's demand constrained. If we're going to work on something, then I prefer the opposite. Yes, is the answer to the question. Sorry. On both those situations, we like demand constrained. So either we can generate it or if it's something that I have a huge amount of my audience that I can push towards, then that's something that'd be interesting. So you're a big student of compounding. Yeah. You talk a lot about it. What skills have you compounded over your career? And talk to me about why compounding is so important. 